Jia, good morning. So let's continue with our stability analysis. Precise linear stability analysis. Of the vortex sheet, that is the interface problem. OK. And <clears throat> we had, right, so Let me do a brief review of last class. So we had this ansatz. I think I used the S. I mean, real time change, because the notation changes from <coughs> text to text. This is my two pi window for my periodic perturbation. Okay, and we want basically to study, what does this say, right? This says we want to study these guys in the neighborhood, right? Epsilon small, in the neighborhood of the stationary solution. The stationary solution is this one. OK? This is refreshing. And then we got now. This is what I was explaining last night. We got the equations for the tildes, which are the order epsilon equations. So I'm skipping the calculation. This sometimes we do in the, in the PDEs course or the fluids course, which is you plug this into the full equations. The 2U two, two S0 satisfies the stationary solution, so the order one equations are satisfied. The order epsilon equations, I'm going to write here. And the high order terms, epsilon squared, blah, blah, I'm forgetting because I'm saying at this moment it is not that important. OK? So here's the order epsilon equations. This is what we were doing last time. So it's sigma. I wrote in a slightly different order. It does not matter. OK, and let me sort of write this in the interest of time. Oops, there's a minus here, a minus here. Okay, so I'm skipping some of the details of the notation. I think it's clear, right? I have now this not friendly looking, but I mentioned this last class. This will become a very friendly looking elementary system if we identify the Hilbert transform. So this is a linear system of equations for these guys, the perturbations. 
look, the curvature is the linear curvature now, second derivative of y. This term is just like this one, so I'm just avoiding details, right? S prime has to, x prime has to do with s prime, okay, just to simplify. This sign is the same as this one, and I have this. This guy is a linear system, right? So here we have a linear, so this is a linear integral differential, say, equations. Even more than just, even more than integral, is like singular integral, right? And today we're going to learn what does this means in terms of stability, just now, and then I'll start talking about how to do this numerically, okay? Which looks quite challenging, but you'll see, well, collapse to something nice and simple, which is good also for us to discuss <coughs> numerical problems of investigation, research problems from the late 80s, early 90s, right? And we learn a lot of stuff, hopefully, right? If I explain things properly. Okay, so now, this, okay, as I explained last time, I think I have to write this again for, for us. So let me write now that we have note that we have Hilbert transforms on the circle. So last time I explained, what is it? Is a Hilbert transform. I'm not going to write the Hilbert transform again, but it's a Hilbert transform on the circle, which means from 0 to 2 pi. That's why it's called on the circle. And it's a Hilbert transform for periodic functions. Okay, so the, the Hilbert transform periodic functions, I'm going to write two cases here. I'm actually already looking at as if I was doing the, uh, the Fourier transform of these guys. Okay, I'll, I'll explain this to you, what I mean, in just a second. I mean, I think you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so these are the Hilbert transforms. <coughs> Excuse me. These are the Hilbert transforms on the circle. And this is the Hilbert transform. So let me put it this. Um, Hilbert transform of F, F periodic. where I'm already thinking of it as a sine series, right? So I'm looking component by component. It's a linear operator. I can look component to component, OK? And as I mentioned last time, I can look at the cosine or the sine. I'll tell you why I'm looking at the sine only. And here, it's the Hilbert transform of f prime, the derivative of f, OK? And even, oops, I forgot here, too. And I, as I mentioned last time, since these guys are differentiable, because f is, dif I'm supposed, I mean, the cosine is differentiable, of course, but I'm also admitting that f is differentiable, this guy has a singularity of the first order. That's why I can use Cauchy principle value. Why? Because when s hits s prime, boom, this singularity cancels with one of this giving the derivative of the guy evaluated at that point. So it's, a, it's still a Cauchy principle value. It's still a, a pole type singularity. Everybody's OK with this? right? Now, what is super cool, I love this. When I saw this the first time, what is super cool, and I'll mention this in just a second later, later on, is that we can do this, these integrals with spectral accuracy, which means that for k, 
less or equal to n over 2, it's exact up to round of error. Now, do you understand why I say for k less or equal to n over 2? So numerically, so we, let me write this as a note. We can, and I'll tell you how, right? We can, I already mentioned about that. With spectral accuracy, OK, let me already give away right, the method I already mentioned, but I still haven't explained, which is the alternate trapezoidal rule. Super simple, super cool, super smart. We'll get to this later on. So we can compute these, these, these means integrals, these Hilbert transforms numerically with spectral accuracy, OK, for k less or equal to n over 2. OK, because n over 2 is what? Do you know why I'm putting this restriction on the Fourier wave number band? I mentioned this. A few times, but fast, but not in this way. So say it. No, not due to symmetry. But it's OK. No, it's fine. Say things. Even if it's, I say it's not, because it's good exercise. OK, so Masu? Say in Portuguese. Say it in French, in German. I don't, under, I don't know how to speak German, anyway. Not aliasing, but you're doing something correct with your hand. So help Masu. Come on. You guys are friends. It's easy because I've already explained, and I want you to react, react to these things fast. But it's OK, right? We're training. It's, you're not fast enough yet because we're training. That's no big deal. This, I've never mentioned this with this name. <coughs> so let me give you the name, which is the good name. Nyquist frequency. Does that say anything to you? No? OK, that's good. So you learned something else. Nyquist frequency is the frequency associated, so in some sense you're correct, right? It has to do with aliasing, but is the frequency associated with the sawtooth mode. So n over 2, cosine n over 2, is the sawtooth mode. So I'm going to come back to the problems we're going to see numerically because of this. So the cosine is plus 1 minus 1. So Master was doing the right thing with the hands. And sine of n over 2 is useless because it's 0 on the grid. It already goes aliasing. Okay? So when I put k over n over 2, it's the, the lesser equal is really only for the cosine because for the sine, it should be strictly less than n over 2 or else the sign is 0 on the grid. OK? Now, so that's why I'm saying spectral accuracy, or else kind of I get aliasing. OK? Or I get wrong, wrong results. So that, that is correct. So this is the Nyquist frequency, right like this. In this case, it's a spatial frequency because it's a wave number. OK? So now, we have, with these formulas, which will be useful for us to do our numerical stability analysis also, because we can re replace these sums, these integrals by sums, sorry, using the alternate trapezoid rule, and we get exactly these results. So you see here, I'm computing. I am computing. Yeah, this is correct. I, I almost thought this wrong, because think of this. This, let me tell you how I thought I had made a mistake, and I, and I figured myself out, which is good. If this is the, the Hilbert transform, let's put it this way. The Hilbert transform takes a harmon the trace of a harmonic function, in this case on the real axis, to the trace of its harmonic conjugate. OK, so if it's act acting on a complex function, say complex on the upper half plane, the trace on the real axis, so I make, if, if I act, the Hilbert transform on the trace of the real axis, it gives me back the trace 
of the harmonic conjugate of that function that I started with. Okay, I actually show, the, show these things to you when I do for sure the PDEs and applications course, and I don't remember if I did it for the fluids course. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to know this here. This here, that's just cultural information. Okay, now, so here I'm doing the Hilbert transform of the cosine of the derivative of the cosine. So the derivative of the cosine is a sine, and the Hilbert transform of it is going to give me back sort of a cosine-like guy. And here, I'm doing the Hilbert transform of the sine. It's giving me a cosine with a minus sine, blah, blah, blah. That has to do a little bit thinking about, uh, about uh, <clears throat> if you complexify these guys. This is, again, just don't worry about it if it's not making sense to you. But now, th now the important comment I made last time, and I want to repeat it today. The stability analysis, theoretical stability analysis, and the numerical will be similar. Of this set of equations, the odd modes, which are the sines, decouple from the even modes, which are the cosines. Okay? So I, um, I'm only going to do it, and the result is the same. Right? Whatever, whatever you get for eigenvalues of your matrix, the system is the same, so that you can check. So I'm only going to do it for the even modes, the cosines. So look what I'm going to do without doing. I mean, I would do more details in the other courses, but I'm going to indicate. I'm going to give to you soon a system where this is going to collapse by identifying that this is a Hilbert transform. This is going to collapse into a pathetically simple linear system of equations for the amplitudes of our modes. So look what I'm going to do. OK, so what I'm going to do, yeah, I had this in the, other, in the other, so I'm going to do this. Look, let me write this in a very simple way. Okay, so I'm gonna, I want to substitute this guy in here, get an OD for the amplitudes, and ask myself and ask you, will the amplitudes grow, decay, or oscillate? Which will tell me about instability of the problem, legitimate instability. Now it's a dynamical instability. It's not yet a numerical instability. I will talk about the numerical instability further on. So, okay? So, this will depend on, say, the eigenvalues of the matrix. Now, I'm going to show to you that these cosines, right, they only talk to themselves. They don't talk to the sines. That's why odd modes interact with odd modes, even modes with even modes. If I plug this into this first equation, excuse me, first equation, it's very simple to see <coughs> that I can cancel the cosine on both sides. This is dA1 dt cosine. Cosine differentiated twi twice is cosine. I cancel the cosine and I get an OD for A1. Okay? That's very easy. The other one, the other two, believe me, but I, I mean, you don't have to trust me so much. Believe me, because this guy gives me back cosines, cosines, and so on. So let me show it to you quickly. If I put a cosine here, which is this guy, and this guy is a cosine, right? Look at that formula, the second formula there. It gives me back a cosine, and I can cancel the cosines. Okay? Now this one, this also will give me back a cosine, because the same thing is here. Now this one, if this guy is a cosine, I differentiate it in S, it becomes a sine. The Hilbert transform of a sine gives me a cosine. So simplify all the cosines, and we get the following system. So we get that.
Then we got this linear system of ODs. So look how nice. We start from a nonlinear problem with singular integrals. We linearized. We got this problem, linear problem with singular integrals. And by using Hilbert transform that appears in many different problems, right, in signal processing, it's useful in many ways. Now my linear stability problem goes down to this. So what do I need to check now to see if this problem is dynamically, not numerically yet, dynamically stable or unstable? We know it's unstable, right, because it's called the kelvin helmholtz instability problem. So why is this problem unstable? In words, you don't have to do computations in your head. You just have to give me the keyword. Eigenvalues, right? Eigenvalues, I have to check if they're real, imaginary, or complex, or real, whatever, and have, in particular, a real positive part. Then that will say, hey, it's an inst a legitimate instability problem. Correct. OK, so if we look at the eigenvalues, this is what we get. Okay, this is what we get. Now, now I'm in the position to tell you the story of, of, of the research problem from the late 80s, early 90s, that Robert Krasny, who's now a professor at the University of Michigan, Department of Mathematics, made an important breakthrough in a very clever and now, I mean, easy to understand way, but at the time, people were like publishing all sorts of papers some of them doing, as I mentioned, the dynamics of the numerics. Okay, so let's go to, to, to then the numerical. So Krasny was the first one to analyze this problem in the days with sigma equal to zero. Because sigma is the surface tension coefficient. And as I will show to you, surface tension regularizes the linear problem. And Krasny, based on Moore's paper, wanted to provide numerical evidence of Moore's analysis, which was not was highly non-trivial, but not rigorous, and so on, and, and conjecture that nonlinearity in the surface tension problem, zero surface tension problem, nonlinearity did not regularize the problem. The curvature, you start with a smooth profile. This one, C infinity. The curvature here blows up in finite time and the critical time according to, to Moore, Moore's conjecture, was that it would blow up as the log of 1 over epsilon. And Krasny was the first one to show in the computer in a very precise way that Moore's conjectures were beautiful, were right on the money. How did he do that? And what were the mistakes people were doing before? That's what I'm going to present to you now. <coughs> OK, so look at this. So um, let's see how I write this. No, it's basically, it's basically here. So when I have zero surface tension, OK, this is lambda as a function of k. So look, when I have zero surface tension, I have an eigenvalue that's zero. This zero eigenvalue doesn't affect the dynamics because it's zero. It has to do a little bit with the parametrization, right, if I choose depend on the parametrization, like these guys here, S, whatever, that I have some freedom to do arc length or whatever. OK, no big deal. And I have one guy that grows and one guy that decays. So this is the guy. This is the guy that worries me, right? The, the positive real eigenvalue. And when surface tension is 0, it's going to be 
plus or minus UK, where U has to do with the shearing. So it's this straight line here. Okay? And then you see that the problem, the linear problem, is ill posed. Why is the linear problem ill posed? Because this is unbounded, this grows forever. And high frequencies, say if you're doing a Fourier series, right? Fourier series, you sum from zero to infinity. The high frequencies have an unbounded growth rate. Okay? And Krasny understood that that had an impact on the numerical method. So let me, let, let me show to you. I'm going to get some pictures in copy. So, and you can see that when you have surface tension, okay, when you have surface tension, how does surface tension regularize the problem? No. Eh. So as, as k goes to infinity, that's correct, as k goes to infinity, when this guy here becomes bigger than this guy, the eigenvalue becomes imaginary, and things start oscillating instead of growing. And that's like a regularization through oscillation, whatever. L reminds us a little bit. It's not quite a dispersive, but it reminds us. So it basically, the curve is something like this. And you have a critical... You have a critical wave number where beyond this wave number, modes don't grow anymore. They oscillate. High frequencies oscillate. So it regularizes the problem because there's, there is a bounded growth rate, which is only this guy's in this wave band. Okay? So this showed two things that people knew for a long time before Krasny. The linear zero surface tension case is ill-posed. You're okay with that? High frequencies go and grow, grow in an unbounded fashion. So small little perturbations will grow very fast. And people knew that surface tension regularized the linear problem. So people wanted to know what happens in the nonlinear problem. And for example, sometimes nonlinearity could arrest, which is hold, the instability and, and hold and actually make this ill-posed problem well-posed. Okay, well, but then Moore said, "Look, you can start with the scene. Fin you lose basically almost all derivatives because the curvature will blow up in finite time." And he estimated the time, and people wanted to check this on the computer. Okay, so Krasny then started. Let me try to do some figures reproducing here. You have it in the notes, but so we can discuss. I decided not to bring the laptop because you know, just showing a figure. Like I'm going to just sketch things. It's enough for the discussion. So Krasny did some computations. So this is Krasny. And where's the, the dates? I, I put it last time. It's like late 80s, early 90s. Well, let me not waste time with this. Oh, yeah, here it is, JFM. It's right in front of me. JFM, Journal of Fluid Mechanics, 86. So Krasny did a computation that the picture I'm going to show you is like this. Look, here is the interface. And he did the surface tension, zero surface tension case, and, and with uh, Moore's um, equations, which goes from zero to one. I wrote this a few lectures ago. No big deal. OK. And he, he did this for, at different times. So here is a sketch of the interface at different times. So. Um, this is, he writes this as time zero two, at later time, time zero seven five. So actually very quickly on the computer, Krasny saw this. He has here the, the interface perturbation, which in some sense he was using um, minus sign, okay? And then he has like points. You see on the graph some points like this. And here he starts seeing a little bit of noise. OK, so the exact solution, can you see from the back, Eduardo? Right? So the exact solution would be this curve. Right? Instead of sine, I think he used minus sine. doesn't matter. And, 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 and then 
these are the points which he solved. I'm going to show you the equation. It's a, a, called a, a point vortex method. And then later on, just a little time on, he sees something really a mess. In the sense that you can't, you can't even sort of see a well-defined curve. OK? So these are Lagrangian markers. Let me maybe show you. I had separated here to facilitate. So numerically, this is more or less how you solve the problem numerically. You do like this. And I'll show you this in more detail. No, this is for the full problem, sorry. So think of this as, as the method of lines. OK, the method of lines. We can discretize, OK, in this way. So gamma j, xj, and yj are, say, points. Whoops, terrible drawing. OK, so this, this guy here is at xj, yj, and also has a gamma j associate, associated to it. OK, so basically, if we learn coming back over here for the linear problem, let's pretend we're doing the linear problem. If I compute the second derivative at a point j, I compute this integral here as a sum, this as a sum. And I think as this as an ODE, this is the method of lines. I've discretized it in space. And if I, comp if I know how to compute this on my grid, which I told you, I, I know how to compute these guys by sums. I'm going to show you soon. Basically, I can think of this as a system of ODEs. And I can evolve it with, say, Rangakara or whatever method. I think Krasny at one point did Rangakara. Later on, Mike Shelley maybe did predictor corrector. I, in my postdoc, I did predictor corrector. It doesn't really matter, OK? So OK, so you know what, what happened? When people, some people that did before Kras this, they saw this, this, this um, very irregular dynamics. They said, oh, this system here is chaotic, blah, 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 OK? And there were some papers saying that it was chaotic. And then Krasny said, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He said, um, look, this computation here, he did it with seven digits. Of accuracy, which is single precision on the computer, typical computer. And then he did this computation again. With 16 digits. And this solution at time 0, 7, 5 was a little better. Still a little noisy here. OK, this is a caricature of what you would see here. In, oops, sorry, what would you see here in the notes, OK? Just, just a caricature so I can tell the story. So he said, wait a minute. I just increased the number of nodes the number of digits, sorry, not the number of nodes. I just said it wrong, sorry. The number of nodes are the same. I think it was 100. Yeah. N equal to 100. This does not change. He just changed the number the, of digits of accuracy. That is the precision. OK. And then he went to a supercomputer. I think you went to supercomputer, but also you can do this using software, right? I forget which one he did. But then he did this, 0, 1. At the same time, 0, 3, 
0.75. He did 29 digits. And the curve was very well defined. OK, so here's a, a challenge for you. There's a, there's a fee, a challenge, which is seven digits he saw. He couldn't even see an interface at this time. With 16 digits, it got a little better organized. But in this region, it was already getting messy. And he went, when he went to 29 digits, which at the time, you could either go to a supercomputer. My thesis, I ended up going to a supercomputer because I had some ill conditioning, whatever. And the fact that I used double precision on the supercomputer was 29 digits. And the fact also that I had a vector processor, which made things faster, was very useful for me, OK? Just as a fact. Also, there is numerical software where you can sort of pretend in a good way that you have more digits, of course your code becomes slower. But if, you, if you're solving a problem where you really need accuracy, right? people sometimes use software that does that. But your answer to me, somebody help me, what went through Krasny's mind and what was his conclusion when he did this was just, just checking, just changing the numerical arithmetic. Not there's no, the, tr the truncation error does not change. And the discretization does not change. It's just a finite digit algebra, right? The arithmetic. With 29 digits, he got a very smooth interface. And actually, this is more or less the critical time. At this time, the curvature was blowing up. But as I told you, a curvature that is a second derivative to blow up our eye doesn't catch. So how did Krasny look that there was a second derivative blowing up using the Pally-Wiener theorem? Doing, looking at the tail of the Fourier series, as I mentioned last time, and I will repeat this, and write, and maybe even give you exercises to make sure you understand, OK, on the computer. So but the first thing, so why, what is Krasny showing us? What went through Krasny's mind? when he showed that, look, if I increase the digits of accuracy, only that, I get a very nice interface. What I presented to you in class up to now is enough for you to understand what went through Krasny's mind. Of course, it, it's simple after, it's, again, simple after I tell you the answer. Not so simple, because it's the first time you've seen it. But it's an interesting question. So you can say something wrong, no big deal. Try to answer this question. How do you explain this from what we saw today in class? So good exercise for you to go and you know and try to answer it, even if you give me the wrong answer, no problem. Nobody wants to volunteer. So what is the source? of this thing there that people said mistakenly that it was, oh, it's a chaotic system. Well, it's not a chaotic system. You just add more digits of accuracy. You just do the computation with more accuracy in, in the arithmetic, not, not in the discretization. And things become nice and clean. So the system is not chaotic, actually. It is, it's a numerical, it's a numerical instability, but it's coming from where? Well, you, there's, let me give you a hint, right? It's, let me give you a hint, which is kind of clear. I mean, it's obvious once you've seen this once or twice, but this is just saying that I am improving my round off error because I am doing calculations with more digits, right? So I'm improving my round off error. Sorry? Say again. Aqui? Here? Yeah. So, so you see that this, this sort of craziness 
is, is sort of a high frequency. It's a, it's a noisy thing, right? Small. So look, at, so look at this. Look at this. Let's see if I can explain to you. And this is happening quite fast. Okay. So Krasny did the second graph, which is this one. Okay, you see in the notes. Well, he, well, he did this. This is K. <coughs> this is the log of the amplitude called P. How should I call it? Of the modes. Uh, P, I think I forgot. No, P, I think, is x plus y. Yeah, I think it's. So let me write P. Yeah, I wrote this last time. I think P is equal to x plus iy. Double check from the la okay from last class. And then look what Krasny saw. So this is a bit of a caricature just to use a little more details just for us to discuss. Look what Krasny saw. This is, you take your solution for the position of the, of the, of the interface, right? You do an FFT and you look at the log of the Fourier amplitude of the position of the, of the interface, OK? At time 0, which is the wide curve, how many modes do you have? Sign. You only have one mode, right? You have mode k equal to 1 and k equal to minus 1. But I don't have to show this because it's just symmetric, right? I mean, sine is e, e to the i kx minus e to the minus i kx divided by 2, right? Euler's formula, OK? So let's just look at the right. So you just have, you just have one mode. I should put this line like this, OK? So at time 0, because I did this perturbation, sine or minus sine doesn't, doesn't matter, I only have one mode. And so if I do the Fourier spectrum, I, I use an FFT to do the Fourier spectrum, I have one mode here. And all the other, these other ones is basically round off error, because I cannot compute sine of x exactly on the grid, <coughs> right? There's a round of error, right? There's a routine, right? All programs have a routine. MATLAB, that you ask for the function sine of x, exponential x, it's an approximation. It's done, say, sometimes with a series or whatever, right? So this is round of error, OK? So the method is telling me, what is the round of error? And then Krasny realized what? Look. This guy here, at the end of the, of the spectrum of my initial data, of my approximate initial data, this guy, these guys over here are going to grow much faster than the legitimate mode. Why? Because of this curve, of this line. These, the round of errors is out here. 
Okay, so it's not chaos. It's it's a numerical instability, and it's a numerical instability, not from the actually the operator point of view of truncation and whatever. It's from the finite arithmetic point of view. Is that clear? Because the those guys they live out here, right? They live out here. So Krasny then realized, look, if I use 29 digits, what he will do, he would get this guy and pull it down here, because the round of error is smaller, and it will take more time for this guy to grow and contaminate the solution. So here, right, that's what's happening. Here, it took more time than here to contaminate the solution. Here, you could see it. Here, you could not see it. So look that once you understand the mathematics, I mean, basically now this curve here that came out of the Hilbert transform, how you can then design numerical things that are simple, super nice. And at one point it was called, for in this problem, it was called the Krasny filter. But super simple, but for this problem it works. The problem is not chaotic. So what Krasny did, so what Krasny did, he did something like this. Let's see, put a line. Well, it doesn't matter where I put it. So let's say, put the line here. Well, let, me, let me just indicate here, like schematic like this, okay? So what Krasny is doing, right, because my figure is, I don't know where the zero x is, it doesn't matter. Because if this is very small, it could be less than, right? So it's, it's still positive. So. so then, this is the line, which was called the Krasny. filter that Krasny said the following. Before I tell the Krasny filter, let's discuss curve orange and curve blue. What is curve orange telling us? So how in words do I say curve orange? So I start with a sign. Okay, so let me put the picture here. Okay, so Krasny's sign is like this. At time zero, it's a sign. But as soon as the clock went on, so let me put it in orange, this curve became a, like this and like this. Is, is the orange curve a sign? No, it's not a sign. And actually, it had started to steepen. So a function, we see this in, in when we talk about PDEs and Berger's equation, when something steepens, whatever, and I mentioned here also about the Gaussian, when something steepens, it's changing faster. If it's changing faster, it needs higher modes in Fourier, right? So look, in Fourier, that's exactly what's happening. As soon as I went from time zero to time, say, 0.2, right, the initial condition that had only one mode now has this band of modes due to the steepening, due to nonlinearity. Nonlinearity, the Fourier modes do not decouple, as when we do right, the solution of a linear PDE. We just do it mode by mode and sum at the end. In nonlinearity, the modes couple. Right? Right? Just think, e to the i kx, if I square it, it becomes e to the i 2 kx. So it immediately goes from k1 to k2 if I have a quadratic nonlinearity. So this band here is a manifestation of nonlinearity, legitimate nonlinearity, because the problem is nonlinear, right? Krasny is not solving that linear set of equations I wrote there. He's solving the ones I wrote last class, the nonlinear ones with surface tension equal to zero. So what I want you to understand is the story of a research problem Kind of recent, right? Recent for me, not so recent for you, because as I mentioned, you're young, 1990s, right? Uh, I, 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 right? It's recent, scientifically speaking. So, okay, so what did Krasny do? What is the Krasny filter? He said, look, if I saw that improving just the arithmetic, the solution improves, there's nothing chaotic here, and this is explained 
by the eigenvalues or like a dispersion relation, if you like. Then he said, OK, I'm going to do the following filter, so smart and simple. I'm going to set a level, right? Here I'm exaggerating above here. Maybe I could do it, I don't know, a little more down here, right? Maybe that's better. So Krasny did the following. He said, he said the following, look, I know that whatever is down here, be, for example, from the initial condition, the white curve, I know that this is round of error. It should not be in the dynamics if, the, if I was doing it exactly. So he, at every time step below this level here that he, 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 he decides, he zeroes all the Fourier components at that level. Because he's saying, these guys, you guys are out of the dynamics. You're here just because I'm using finite precision. So you cannot play the game right now. You can only, these modes, these higher modes here, say, say this, these modes here, you guys can only play the game, get into the dynamics, if you're legitimately invoked by nonlinearity, which means this curve here has to go beyond these guys. So these guys here, for the orange curve, they were zeroed by the filter. But once we got to the blue stage, they're in the game. Do you see what I'm saying? Is it clear they're in the game? Because they were, they're above this curve. They were <coughs> generated by nonlinearity. OK? Is it clear? If it's not clear, ask me questions. OK? <coughs> and then Krasny, by doing this filter, which in, the, in, in these papers of the Kelvin stability problem was called the Krasny filter. It's very simple, but it was very important for this problem. <clears throat> then everybody used the filter. Everybody continued start studying this problem with the filter. Okay? And he basically, with the filter, with the filter, and with seven digits of accuracy, he got a solution very similar to the 29 digits one because he was kind of cleaning consistently the round of error that was not legitimately playing in the dynamics. And why? Because the, the eigenvalue is going to be imaginary. OK? Good. So let's continue then with our numerical um, understanding of the problem. OK, so as a reminder for myself, this OK. OK, I'll, re I'll mention this later on. I mean, the order varies a bit from how I'm teaching the course. Yeah, so let me mention this. So then let me write the problem. Let's talk about the problem with what happens with surface tension, which was actually a problem I worked on my, in my postdoc when I was at Ohio. So <clears throat> So let's think let's now let's write let's write the problem numerically in a generic way, okay? So like this. So this would be the method of lines. And I will tell you in just a second what was my project for my postdoc. myself into trouble. I'm not going to be able to write this. Let me write here. Sorry.
So this is like the method of lines. That is just spatial discretization, OK? This is correct. Is this correct? Yeah, it is. OK, so here, so let me tell you a little bit of the story of this. Sorry, it takes long to write. So this is the method of lines, OK? From the original problem, look, I have here the nonlinear curvature, and I have here written the real and imaginary parts of the interface. Right? So look, this is the method of lines, because this is now a system of ODEs that you can solve by whatever method. Rung, 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 Rungakara, I think, was what Krasny did. I remember. I did it in my postdoc predictor corrector, <clears throat> okay, fourth order predictor corrector. Why? Because these guys were very time consuming to compute at every time, so we would gain a little bit of time with the same order. And look what's done here. Now I have to mention two things. This is the, the singular integral, which I, on purpose, I wrote it without much information, okay? So Krasny, did this. What Krasny did is he summed over these guys. So Krasny was sigma equal to 0, OK? And he would compute these integrals by summing over all m's, OK? But skipping the point where j was equal to m, just skipping the point of the singularity. Why, <coughs> why he, did he do this? So as an integral, as, 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 an, as, an, uh, as a purely integral, singular integral fashion, what he's doing is he's doing this. He uses all these points. He keep, skips this one and uses this one. And, and it's a little bit like he's doing this window here, OK? And one can show that this is like a first order approximation of an integral. OK? Is this clear, this figure that I'm doing here, right? You're just skipping this node here in the middle, right? His physical, his, for those who 
did fluids with me, his physical justification for this was because at this point where these guys are the same, you're computing the speed due to the vortex on, on himself. And we know that a vortex does not move by himself, just spins around. So that's a physical justification for this numerical integration that, you know, from the purely uh, uh, numerical point of view, is like having this, this grid. You just skip the point in the middle. And it's a little bit like a, right? Uh, looks a little bit like the Cauchy into it. Well, what we did, what we did, which is the alternate tra trapezoid rule, so what, what Mike Shelley and also myself we did, Baker and I, is that we used the summation like this. Okay, from m equal to zero. So he sums over old notes, but just skipping this one, Krasny, what we did is this, which is the alternate trapezoidal rule, which I'll give you more information maybe later on, which does this. Let's see. Okay, and this point is the same as this one. Okay, so the alternate trapezoidal rule, this is in the paper, which is the main citation that proves things, is a paper by Sidi and Israeli. Okay, is this. Super clever. So if, if your singularity is at this point, okay, if you're integrant, right? Integrant singularity. If you're integrant singularity, so you can do this, you can test this, it's beautiful for the Hilbert transforms, right? If you like. So what is the alternate trapezoid rule? You can prove, you can prove, Sid Israeli proved this, that if your singularity is at this point here, you integrate only using the blue points. That's why it's called the alternate trapezoidal rule. So all you do, look how beautiful, all you do is the trapezoidal rule for the blue nodes. Okay? If, if your singularity is in the blue node, all you do is you do the alternate trapezoidal rule, that is you do the, uh, the trapezoidal rule over the orange nodes. So the only price you're paying is that your trapezoidal rule, instead of having spacing h, has space 2h. But in doing this, see the Israeli, they prove that in doing this, you have spectral accuracy for the Hilbert transform. Okay? In other words, if you have a band-limited function, like sine of x, you do the Hilbert transform of sine of x with only round-off error if you use this technique. A little bit of the intuition why this technique works. I mean, and actually Mike Shelley gives a little bit of this intuition more than the C.D. Israeli paper is because if, if the singularity is here, right, so somehow your function is blowing up like this, right, you, the singular part, is odd, okay, and you're going to use the orange, the orange grid to compute this. And actually, by doing that, you get a very good cancellation of the singular part and you integrate very accurate, accurately the regular part of the solution. So, right, a solution like for these integrals here, it's like you have a singular part, which is the part that blows up like 1 over x, plus an analytic part. And an analytic part, a periodic analytic, this is another, another theorem that 
it doesn't appear much in books, but if you integrate a, a, a smooth function, a periodic or a smooth function, a periodic smooth function using the trapezoidal rule, it is spectrally accurate. Right? The trapezoidal rule, in general, on an interval from A to B with different boundary conditions in A and B, has its order of approximation, second order. Just a second, just a second, second order. But if it's for a periodic function, then it's spectrally accurate. It has spectral accuracy, means, meaning that the order of approximation depends on the smoothing of the function, as we saw with the pally wiener theorem. Okay? So it's, it's a very nice fact. So yes, look. Is the main concern is the relative power for the eye? Sing. Yes. Right. Yes. Good question. The principal value, so what was asked is that the principal value does not have to be zero. An example. Let me remind this because this is a very good question. So let me, let's see what I do this here. Look. And this is good because this tells me a little bit, it's something maybe I might give you to read. I don't know. It's a little bit of a challenge to read a, a little bit one of the theorems in Cities Rayleigh. And what do they do? Here's, here's a little bit a flavor of what they do. This is not necessarily zero, right? Because the F doesn't have to be symmetric about zero. Agree? Right? And somehow, somehow, this integral here, the value, will have to do somehow a little bit with the derivative of f at 0. Right? Because also, you know, because you see, you can, you can also consider this. Oops, sorry. Sorry, I have to put here and here, OK? So I'm going to give you a little bit of the idea of what goes on in the Sid Israeli paper, which sometimes we do it on numerics too. But after, and people would do that also when they had the singular integral, but I think there's nothing better than the alternate trapezoidal rule in particular when you are in a peri periodic domain. But if you're not maybe in a periodic domain, well, maybe this is what you can do. Look at this. What did I write here? What's the value of this guy? This is an arrogant way of writing zero. Do you agree? Very arrogant way of writing zero. Do you guys understand the joke why it's arrogant? Because this is zero. So it's an arrogant way like writing zero. Well, arrogant is a joke and a bad joke because it's a smart way of writing zero. Because if you combine this with this, in the Cauchy principal value, you desingularize this integral. And that's a bit the trick that CDs rarely do. In their proof, they desingularize the integral. Do you understand what, what I mean by desingularizing the integral? Help me. Maybe Lucas, you're shaking your head. You want to take a try? So if I use what I'm saying is if I use this, I can desingularize my integral. Please, take, take a crack at it, even if it's wrong. Look, if I put this together with this in, in the limit definition of the Cauchy principal value, right? Then I can put this guy, of course this guy is a constant, I can put it inside the integral. I can then make this guy minus this guy divided by that guy and the, singular, the integral, if f has a derivative, it's not singular anymore. The integral is not singular anymore. If it has a derivative, this is just the definition of the, of the derivative. When x hits, well, not x, but when y hits 0, right? Or, sorry, x. Yeah, y goes over x, whatever, depending on where I, lo I locate things, right? Yeah, this f. So, no, this is wrong, sorry. <sighs> Come, guys, when you see a mistake, please com compare because I, it's this. Yeah, in here, yeah. In here. Is, is this what I mean? I was just thinking about the one on that. Sorry. But I think you understand the story, right? And if you see a silly mistake of mine, please correct. It's just that 
In the other case, we had a convolution. We, we don't have a convolution, right? Sorry. So I can just put this guy together with this, and it will be the derivative of f at 0, right? So sorry for the mistake. I forgot to conclude, but I had the x minus y minus. But complain. When you see a silly mistake, help me. And it's, and it's being recorded. The, the mistake is going to be there for 100 years. And I cannot ask for 100 years of secret, as some people do. So anyway. So, so this mistake is taped, right? So you, you see what I mean? This is, this is desingularizing the integral. Okay? And that's a little bit how the proof of Sidi and Israeli works. Okay? Desingularizing the integral. Okay, so I made this mistake. I lost a little bit track. Maybe not. Oh, yeah. So now, let me get some water. Now, and this soon will be a good point to finish because then we come back only on Monday. And right, I have to refresh our memories. So look, if I gave you this to solve, I'm going to actually next class do in more detail the linear problem. But here's the problem. Here is the problem that uh, actually came to my to me as my postdoc project with Greg Baker at Ohio State University, where I spent three years. <clears throat> so he said, "Look, Andre, we 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 know that Krasny solved the zero surface tension case. Very smart way of doing the filter." Now we want to know if we can add the physical ingredient to the problem, a legitimate ingredient, to regularize the problem. Well, it's known that surface tension regularizes the problem in the linear case. And there was a researcher, a very good guy, Dan Pullen from Caltech, who had added surface tension, but he also encountered a little bit of noise near the place where the, the interface was would blow up without surface tension, OK? And Greg Baker said, let's investigate this and see what's going on. So what, how was Dan Pooling solving the problem, the professor from Caltech? He, was, he had a few methods. One of his methods was not to use the alternate trapezoidal rule, right? I think the first one that sort of brought that into, the, into this game was Michael Shelley, which is a professor from these days from the Courant Institute, and was a former student of Greg Baker, okay? not at Ohio State, but at Arizona, before Greg Baker went to Ohio. And then Mike Shelley eventually did positions here and there, and until today, and he's a super guy in applied math, math is at the Courant Institute. He did the trapezoid. Well, what Poulin did, so Poulin is like this. That he did a very nice paper, Pullin, because Pullin, at one point, he says, and that's the right way to do it, says, look, this is what's happening. I'm seeing some noisy things here. And I do not, it's not clear to me if it's numerical or if it's legitimate from the problem, because surface tension adds uh, oscillations of high frequencies, right, as we see there from, from the eigenvalue. So Pullin did a very nice, he said, look, and then I tried to do some smoothing, you know, with polynomials averaging. And it's not clear what's going on. So very nice paper that presents you the step for a next study. And Greg Baker knew Poulin and said, Andre, I think this is a good problem for us to study. And the problem was like this. So Poulin was doing the integral, the singular integral. One of the ways he does, I think in his paper, he does more than one way. I forgot to refresh my memory. But one of the ways, I think he, he both does the Krasny way, which is skipping the point. <laughs> And also, he does it desingularizing a little bit in this way, which is subtract like a fancy zero, and you, you desingularize the integral. And he was still seeing this sort of a little bit numerical instability. So very nice study, but why was that guy coming in was inconclusive. Okay? So what is this d here? What did I put here? Yeah, here, this d. This d, I'm writing in a generic way, because we can do this differently is a numerical differentiation. Okay? So Poulin was using for this numerical differentiation. So see, if you have this numerical differentiation, this numerical operator that differentiates could be finite difference, for example. Poulin did not use a finite difference, but it could be. He used something that looked a little better. 
So this would be a first order finite difference. I mean, for the first order derivative, and this is the operator to some extent, like used twice, if you like, or it's a second derivative, a second. This represents, actually, this is the best way to say it. This represents a second order derivative, discrete derivative, OK? First order discrete derivative, second order discrete derivative, first order discrete derivative squared, so not to be confused, right? Because of the definition of the curvature, OK? And your derivative of a. So Poulin used for D cubic splines. OK? So I'll probably do this, I don't know, I'll probably do this the next class. I don't want to rush. And refresh your memory or explain to you what a cub cubic spline is. Who knows what a cubic spline is here? OK? I'll refresh your memory. Some of you do. So I refresh. It's basically piecewise polynomial approximation, right? So Poulin did piece cubic splines. So it's cubic splines of very, very high order. So next class, I'll explain to you, but it's basically just as a motivation, if you have a function here, you define panels, right? And in each of these panels in, on your grid, the grid does not need to be uniform. OK, inside here, you do a cubic polynomial. And inside this other one, this other one, you use another cubic polynomial. And you kind of, I'll explain how you glue them together. <coughs> Let's see what, what, what you remember. Why do I use, why does one use cubic splines, which is piecewise polynomials, instead of just a polynomial, one polynomial of higher degree over the whole interval? Why doing it piecewise? What is the motivation, numerical motivation to do it piecewise? Sorry? Mm, not quite. You're going to be able, you're going to be able to see. Let me actually say one more thing, and then I'll come this back to this next class. Look, if I have a polynomial, a cubic polynomial, for each of these guys, which means in each interval here, I'm going to get the coefficients of the cubic polynomial. There are four coefficients, right? A, a 0, a 1, a 2, a 3, whatever the names are, right? Multiplying the monomes, right, of constants for sort of, right? And then if I, if I find the coefficients inside this interval, I can approximate the derivative of f by differentiating my polynomial, by doing the first order differentiation or a second order differentiation of my polynomial. That's easy, piece of cake, right? But then the question going back, so if first order, second order to what we were saying, what master? But now, why do I want to? This is an important question. I see you're not reacting immediately. Why? But I think you've seen this. Why do I want to use a piecewise polynomial? Cubic is good because cubic, the reason for using cubic, it's high order. I have four degrees of freedom, which are the four constants. I can ask, I'll talk about this next class, I can ask for continuity, of course, at this point, which means interpolation. I can then ask more, say, hey, I want the derivative also to be continuous the, at this point. The derivative does not need to be exactly the derivative of my function f, because I don't have that information. I just have pointwise information of the function. But my interpolant will be C1. OK? It's, or else I could, have, I could have continuity like this, which means the derivative jumps. Right? So splines give you this nice, smooth, right, sort of a look of, of, the, of, the, of the approximation. OK? The reason is for using splines is that if you have something that's very oscillatory or whatever, you do not want to use a higher order polynomial. Because polynomials of high degree are what? Yeah, unstable. And there's a famous problem, which is the Runge problem, which shows that 
when I teach numerical analysis, I show this, and here's a, if you want an approximation, a, a smooth function like this, right? And you start pulling pull, pull numbers of high degree, fair high degree, eventually, you know, it goes through the points here, but it oscillates a lot here in the extremes and actually can generate very bad, very bad behavior. That's called the Runge problem, the same Runge of Runge Kuta. Okay? So polynomials of high degree are highly unstable. So one way to see this, one very easy way to see this, if you're going to teach you know, students, younger friends, in numerical uh, analysis is the Vandermond matrix is a very ill-conditioned matrix. As you make n go to infinity, which means you're asking more and more points, it, the condition number grows very, very fast. So you never want to use, you know, what, one sort of informal way, right, very informal way of saying this, is that you put the high degree polynomial here, and you ask it to go through all these points here, right? This is informal, right? It's like the polynomials really make an effort, like a gymnastics, to go up and, and fit through these points. And when it gets at the end of the interval, right, the polynomial usually, when it goes to minus or plus infinity, if it's a high degree polynomial, it grows very fast, right? So somehow, that's a little bit why you see these things, these ears growing at the extremes, okay? And one way of dealing with these things too are Chebyshev polynomials, where the nodes are chosen, right, through the zeros of polynomial, of trigonometric polynomials, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to get into this. But actually, in Trefethen's book, he mentions about this. That's why I want to mention it to you. Okay, so you, you don't want to use high degree polynomials. This is why you use cubic spines. Poulin did a legitimate choice for, okay, I have this problem. I need to compute derivatives with a given smoothness and so on and so on, right? Because I want to find if there's a curvature blowing up or not, which is a second derivative, right? You mentioned about second derivative. Legitimate choice. But we under, in the paper with Greg Baker, we understood that this guy, this guy not pulling, this guy, cubic spines here, this guy, was not good for high frequencies, OK? This is the theme of next, next, next class. And I'll give a spoiler for next class. So what did we realize, right? It was 100% clear, so I tried it, worked, and then we were able to, to show is that, OK, cubic splines, computing these derivatives was bad. And you, you see next class kind of the interpretation of why it's bad. So what we did is then, and in particular, because we were using then Mike Shelley's idea, it was not his idea, but Mike Shelley's idea based on Cid Israeli and using the spectral accuracy, then I thought with Greg Baker, look, if the most difficult part of the problem, okay, the most difficult part of the problem, which is the singular integral, we now know how to do it with spectral accuracy better than Pullen or Krasny did. I mean, I'm not criticizing them. They did the first step, important steps in an important, difficult problem, right? And then you can improve. So we said, OK, so now we know how to do the integration as good as it can be with spectral accuracy. So let's do everything with spectral accuracy. That means, help me, FFT for this guy, two, 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 this guy, OK? And then I said, yeah, now we're going to have a method that's spectra accurate. But then, to my surprise, the Nyquist frequency messed up my life. Don't miss next class, and you know how my life got back into order anyway, how, how we fixed it. OK? So good point to stop. And sorry about the mistakes here. <laughs>